Hello, and welcome to ANSA's webinar titled Alcohol and Drug Use, Supporting Migrant Workers Who Are Facing Addiction. My name is Sabrina Dimitra, and I'm ANSA Settlement and Integration Program Manager, and I will be facilitating today's live webinar. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge and thank the Government of Canada's Migrant Worker Support Network Project for funding today's event. And so I just wanted to go over today's agenda just so that everyone's aware of the flow of, of the webinar before I hand it over to our first speaker. Um, uh, so our first speaker today is Gerald Thomas from the BC Ministry of Health, and I'll be introducing Gerald in, in a moment. Following Gerald's session, we will be having a Q&A um, component. And after that Q&A component, we'll be going into our second presentation of the day where we'll be having a team of speakers um, from Diversity Re Community Resources Society, to Ginger Gill, Luce Marina, and Rorinder Camboy. They will be sharing and presenting to us. Um, following their presentation, then we'll have a, another Q&A followed by some closing remarks. So thank you so much. Um, and so I'm just gonna introduce our first speaker, Gerald Thomas, who is a Director of Legal Substances and Problem Gaming Policy and Prevention at the BC Ministry of Health. Um, as well, Gerald is a collaborating scientist with the Center for Addictions Research at BC at the University of Victoria and an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology at UBC and owner-operator of Okanagan Research Consultants. Gerald received his PhD in political science from Colorado State University and has worked in the area of Canadian addiction policy since 2004. He served in the Secretariat of the Working Group that created Canada's first national alcohol strategy in 2007 and has worked on several national and provincial level projects related to substance use and addiction and has published numerous peer-reviewed papers with leading researchers in the field. So it's quite an impressive bio, Gerald, and thank you and glad you were able to join us today. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. I'm hoping that everyone can hear me well. Um, so, you know, just looking at the title of, of this session, uh, I'm going to make a little caveat here at the beginning. My work doesn't focus so much on those folks who have severe alcohol and drug problems, but more on helping uh, the health system and society more generally sort of uh, understand substance use problems, their sources, and in particular thinking about how we can intervene with folks before they sort of fall off the cliff uh, into that uh, really dark place of addiction. So my, my talk will focus more on that sort of how do we uh, identify early problems with substances uh, uh, and, and intervene, uh, except for probably for tobacco, which, which we do a bit of cessation work. My, my portfolio includes uh, tobacco cessation. So there's a place where we are working with the real uh, addicted folks, folks addicted to nicotine. But um, in general, my talk will be more about prevention, how do we sort of, again, identify and intervene earlier with folks who may be having problems, uh, and, and then also some policy work, and I'm going to focus on cannabis since that's the new kid on the block and everybody seems interested in that. So next slide, please. So here's the outline. We're going to look at this, uh, this uh, concept of prevention. And here I'm going to give you some details around uh, what we call the low risk drinking guidelines. So this is sort of... Hmm, I think a reasonable bar for the population, if you think about the population as a whole, a reasonable bar to sort of consider uh, that the use above this level could, you know, sort of uh, bring on future problems. So here's that sort of bar we're going to set to say above this level, you really should be thinking about your drinking. Uh, and uh, we're also going to talk about the Quit Now Smoking Cessation Support Service in, in British Columbia. This is a, a government funded uh, works off of the web, works off of chat, works off of text, ways for to help people who are trying to quit smoking. Very important thing to do for health is to quit smoking. It's a leading cause of, uh, of disability and death uh, uh, in our society. 
going to talk about the lower risk cannabis use guidelines. Again, these are kind of newer, uh, so not quite as well specified, I would suggest, as the lowest drinking guidelines in terms of giving us numbers to think about, numbers of drinks, uh, patterns of use to think about, but some ideas for how to use cannabis in a, in a safer way if you're going to choose to do that. Uh, we're also going to talk about signs of potentially problematic use, again, with the idea of uh, helping identify problems before they get uh, so bad that, that folks are, are in that addiction realm. And I have put into the chat uh, a link uh, to a referral system, really, that BC has for mental health and addictions issues. So if folks are really in that deep, deep you know, place of, of uh, you know, their use severely affecting their, their life and their, and their work, um, that's the place to go uh, in that case. And then last, we're going to talk about just some of the, the basics around cannabis legalization. There's been a lot of change in a very short period of time. And uh, a lot of folks from what from our work sort of asking the population, a lot of folks quite don't understand what's going on out there in terms of legalization. So I'll put some uh, some specific, uh, put, give you some specific information about uh, the new laws and rules. So here, here are the lowest drinking guidelines. These are evidence-based in the sense that we look across the population. You know, we, we're in, in that, that place of needing to provide guidance to people around their drinking to give them a sense of when they might be creeping up in their use and needing a little bit of, of uh, you know, attention in the sense to think about their drinking. So the lowest drinking guidelines essentially to, to put it simply, if you drink above these levels, you are introducing risk uh, of various types to your health or safety. That's kind of, uh, you know, the, the quick and dirty version of it. The science is quite uh, complicated, um, but here they are for women. And we set the bar lower for women for a number of reasons. One is because women are generally smaller and contain less water in their bodies, which means that they manage alcohol a little bit differently. They also, interestingly enough, men have uh, a lot more of a specific enzyme in the stomach that helps break down alcohol. For those, for, so for these reasons, um, women are generally uh, advised to drink less than men. So here we have it. We suggest under the lowest drinking guidelines, no more than two drinks per day. Uh, th and, and then you, you have this little wiggle room, we call it, three drinks on special occasions. And of course, that's open to interpretation. You know, a 20 something might think a special occasion is a Thursday when their friends are going out to a, to a bar. But we, you know, we say special occasions would be things like holiday parties, birthdays. So a few times a year, you're essentially sort of given a little, a little wiggle room to have a bit more on a specific day. On a special occasions and then we give also a weekly limit of 10 drinks per week so what that means really if you think about it uh, if you're drinking two drinks on most occasions you should have a couple of days a week when you do not drink at all so that's for women for men we bump it up a little bit to three drinks per day again for the reasons i described before uh, or four drinks on a special occasion again a few times a year and then 15 drinks a week so this is a very liberal i would suggest uh, level but again these are evidence-based and what we can say is if you drink above these levels you are introducing extra risk for various uh, about 60 or 70 different conditions including several types of cancer uh obviously liver uh, problems and those kinds of things so these are the lower shrinking guidelines uh and I, I recommend that folks share these around socially or in your workplaces or with the folks you interact with just to give everyone really a sense of you know at this level or above you really should be thinking about how much you're drinking uh if you want to reduce uh, health and, so and safety risks so when we talk about drinking, we also have to uh, provide what is a drink because this is one of the problems in our society. You know, if you've been out socially uh, drinking at, a, at a, an establishment, the, the norm, it seems these days, is the larger glasses. So you'll get a nine ounce glass of wine or, uh, you know, a pint of beer. But when we talk about the drinks on that previous slide, we're actually talking about pretty specific amounts, in this case, 12 ounces of 5% beer. Uh, five ounces of uh, six or twelve percent wine, or one point five ounces of spirits. So this is just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, your drinking and and helping other people understand what is relatively low risk drinking. That that the amount per glass really matters, and and it's quite uh, specific as it's shown here. 
I just wanted to also uh, give a, a, a link to uh, a, a self-assessment um, website that is maintained by the Center of uh, uh, Canadian Stupid Substance Use Research. This is the alcohol reality check. You can add, you can sort of follow along. It's a self-assessment. You can share with folks if they're interested in sharing with their uh, with their with their employees and whatnot, and you know, it's it's. I think it's really important, uh, as is stated in sort of the 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 opening to this this webinar. You know, this addiction and and substance use problems really are not evenly distributed in in society as we know. And vulnerable folks tend to have more problems, and and that's often because they're using their their substance use to cope with stress or other problems in their life. Um, so this population is, a, is we would consider a, a vulnerable population. And so very happy to see uh, you guys interested in this topic. But here's a, a website that we could share with folks that is a, a way to sort of self-assess your drinking and you'll get a score and, and some advice for what to do, uh, it, you know, depending on how you score on this reality check, the alcohol reality check. I'm just going to talk now uh, quickly about our uh, smoking cessation support program, I'm giving you an URL there. Uh, this is quite an advanced piece of technology. As I said, it works off, off online. It works uh, through text. You can sign up to get sort of a, a quit plan. They'll text you, you know, encouragements for supporting your quit, ways to deal with uh, 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 your um, uh, cravings and other things. So just as just lots of personalized support for smoking cessation. And again, uh, if there is anything that folks can do to improve their health long term, it is uh, to quit smoking. It's a very uh, physically dangerous, uh, risky uh, behavior. Um, so we we love folks using this website. We're we're in the middle of sort of a process of updating it, and, and other folks around Canada are doing that as well, trying to find the best way with the technology evolving so quickly, the best way to really support people in in this process to quit smoking. Um, so just wanted to share that. There's also, in terms of quit smoke, uh, so smoking cessation, there's also the BC Smoking Cessation Pharmacare Program. I'm not sure, I don't think this is only open to residents, so it might uh, not meet all the needs of, of uh, people in your, um, uh, you know, migrant workers, those kinds of folks. But for those who are residents, there is the smoking cessation program. And here you can actually go to your pharmacist. It used to be quite an involved process to get access, but not anymore. You can just go in and say, I'm a smoker. I want access to the BC uh, Pharmacare smoking cessation program. And you can get uh, uh, free NRT. That's Nick. Therapy, it's gum, patches, those kinds of things. There's also a um, medication um, support. There's a couple of medications that have been proved for smoking cessation support, basically relapse prevention kind of kind of stuff. And I've actually heard from folks that they're quite can be quite effective for some people. But anyway, this program uh, is available uh, for, again for residents in BC who want to quit smoking. Um, and we know. Uh, from the evidence that combining NRT and nicotine replacement therapy, this pharmacare kind of stuff and, and counseling, you know, as a support services through quit. Now you do those two together and your chances of actually quitting smoking uh, for good uh, increase dramatically. So just wanted to make sure folks know about this piece. Uh, oh, next slide. We'll just talks about the the options. One is for NRI uh, nicotine replacement therapy, and the other is for prescription uh, smoking cessation drugs. Uh, and again, I've heard folks say that that uh, that the, the cessation drugs can actually help uh, deal with cravings longer term. So that's alcohol and tobacco. We'll next move into, uh, next slide please, the uh, lower risk cannabis use guidelines. Again, these are relatively new, so we don't have the specificity that we have around things like alcohol where we've had many decades to sort of think about what, what higher risk drinking is and really validate that through scientific research. So I would suggest that the lower risk cannabis use guidelines are, are good to share with folks. Uh, and they're really just recommendations, 10 recommendations to suggest ways to use cannabis more safely. I'll just take on a couple. You can look at them at your leisure, but uh, things like, um, you know, avoiding smoking if you can. Smoking cannabis introduces some of the same risks as tobacco. Those, the jury's still out scientifically, whether it's uh, you know, cancer causing and all of those things, but never a good idea to take smoke into your lungs of any type. So in this case, they recommend vaping or, or edibles. 
uh, when used you know safely appropriately uh, rather than smoking uh, combining with alcohol you know there's a big question right now around the actual risk to, to driving crashes for for cannabis a new paper was just published actually last week from Canada that basically shows the risk from cannabis alone is quite small in fact difficult to actually scientifically determine but we know for a fact that if you combine cannabis and alcohol for example your risk is compounded uh, even compared to what it would be just for alcohol. So that's a piece of advice and do not combine alcohol and cannabis. Uh, that's, that's not recommended. Another one, you know, people have a habit. I think lots of cannabis users of sort of taking a big, whatever draw off their joint or their bong or their whatever, and then holding it in and scientists, science basically shows us that there's no reason to do that, that the body assimilates the THC very quickly in an inhale and you don't need to hold it in. So that's another kind of piece of uh, advice for how to reduce risk. But you can look at the rest of these in, in your leisure and, <clears throat> and get a sense of, of what we recommend when we say low risk cannabis use cannabis use in ways that would reduce risks of, of health uh, or safety harms. I just wanted to sort of finish up this section just to give sense people a sense of, of, you know, when we talk about substances, this idea of stigma and, and, and problems really creates issues for us because what it means is that people who are, you know, sliding up in their use, heading towards sort of problematic use are not, are not very open to sort of, um, discussing that and so it can get really down the road a long ways before you know the problems became become obvious obvious enough for, for someone else to intervene or for for them to get in trouble or hurt or some way that that then brings them to some realization that their use is really uh, you know really moved out of the the realm of low risk um, so these are some signs that folks may be heading towards problems i just wanted to share them you know, not necessarily science-based, but just experience in this realm for a long time, my experience suggests that these are some, uh, uh, actually they are science-based, but not all of them. Some of them are kind of my ideas, but basically if people are losing control of their use, so they start drinking and have a problem stopping, for example, or, 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 or you start using cannabis and have a problem stopping, uh, uh, that's a, a sense that things are, are getting out of control. Uh, increased tolerance, you know, the body's looking for stasis. If you're constantly, you know, throwing a substance at the body, at the, at the brain, it's going to try to adjust. So, and part of that adjustment is, is a, is a reduce, reducing of sensitivity. So next thing you know, you're, you're having to use more to get the same effect. So that's a good, uh, or a sign that, that things might be getting uh, a little, going a little sideways. There's the dependence issue, and this comes down if, you know, if you can't feel normal with it, uh, there, then definitely you're, you're heading towards dependence, some dependence psychological or physical on, on the substance. So that's another you know, key thing to keep in mind. And, uh, me, mind. <clears throat> There's the, the fact of continuing to use, even though you know it's causing problems and harm. Uh, you know, in, in the case of tobacco, pretty much everyone understands it's a very, very dangerous addiction to have. Uh, so believe it or not, something like 70% of all smokers want to quit. It is just that that addiction that, that makes it so difficult to actually let it go. Uh, and I would suggest in the case of smoking, because I'm an ex-smoker, ex-addicted to tobacco, that, uh, that, you know, it's that, it's that emotional management, that, that use of tobacco, that use of nicotine to manage stress and, emo and difficult emotions that uh, really drives addiction in many cases, and in particular uh, relapse from, from a quit attempt. Another one to think about is when loved, your loved ones or, or colleagues or friends are, are bothered by or harmed by your use. This is a, often a good sense that, uh, you know, things are getting out of hand. Uh, and then really, I would say the core to, to a lot of ongoing use is this, or, or, or an entryway into, into problematic use is this, this sort of regular use to cope with, uh, with negative affect, with things like stress, anxiety, and depression. If you're in that cycle, uh, it's definitely time to, to, to get some help. And then we got Kermit over here being a little a little tongue in cheek about uh, I'm, I, tonight I'm drinking until I'm someone else's problem. And that's kind of how things go with some folks. 
Okay, so next slide, we'll, we'll move on uh, to talk about uh, just some details on cannabis legalization. I wanted to do this, it's mainly policy kind of stuff just because there is a lot of change in a very short time. People are, I think, are still a little bit unclear about what the actual rules are. It is legal for adults to possess and use cannabis even in in public in some places. So things have shifted dramatically in the last uh, 12 months or so, nine months. And so I just want to give you a sense of those. So you can learn a lot more about medical cannabis, non-medical cannabis legalization uh, at the link I've, I've given there. There's a ton of information, all kinds, public safety, public health policy, all kinds of information there, but I'll just sketch out sort of the, the contours, if you will. So in British Columbia, uh, adults age 19 and over are allowed to possess and use cannabis for non-medical purposes. It is still illegal for youth to possess and, and use cannabis, except for in cases where they have a medical uh, uh, authorization. Uh, very, very rare, but that, that's, uh, that's one, one way where youth have access that is still, that is legal. Adults can possess up to 30 grams of dried cannabis or their equivalent in oil in public. That means you can carry up to 30 grams uh, and, and not be in any problem. If you have more than 30 grams or its equivalent in oil, you, will, uh, you could get a ticket. Uh, adults can possess up to a thousand grams of dried cannabis or equivalent at home. And so this is a, you know, a, a difference from the alcohol realm where, you know, there's essentially no limit to how much you can have of alcohol at home. But in cannabis, you, you, you're not allowed to have more than a thousand grams at home in your possession at home. So, and legal cannabis, here's I think the wrinkle that confuses a lot of people. Legal cannabis is only available from government outlets. These are stores and online or licensed private retailers. And there's only, I think around, last I checked around 20 stores in the entire province uh, that are now licensed by the government to, to sell non-medical uh, non cannabis. Uh, and of course there is the online store. If you go to the, if you just type BC government uh, cannabis store, it'll come up. Uh, and you can order from there anywhere in the province. Um, but I think the confusion really is there's still quite a number of gray market or illegal outlets that are open that have been allowed and actually licensed, believe it or not, in a couple of places, Victoria and, and Vancouver in particular. And, uh, you know, we're in the process of, of shutting those, those illegal stores down. It's going to be a bit of a process. They're not rushing it in a sense because the supply is still being ramped up around the province. And of course, medical, medical users are still using those, dis those dispensaries, they're called. Um, but if you wanna be legal, you have to buy from a, a legal source, uh, a government or online. It's in this particular package that has excise stamps. It looks official. Um, and so that's uh, something to keep in mind if you're looking to purchase cannabis. Uh, so just more details, adults can generally use cannabis in public where tobacco use is authorized, uh, but there are some additional restrictions that you're not supposed to use in, in places where youth are, are, are frequent, so parks and playgrounds and whatnot are, are off limits you know, across the province. Some places ban smoking in parks as well, uh, look, uh, local governments, but in, in this case, you cannot smoke cannabis in a park or uh, a playground. Uh, cannabis can be transported in a vehicle if it's in its original unopened container. And that way it's, it's, it's the same as alcohol uh, and not accessible to the driver. And in fact, this is the one issue where people are getting ticketed uh, uh, quite a bit in the new regime. Folks who have cannabis uh, in a vehicle that is not stored properly or, or not accessible to the driver or they're caught also with a uh, not legal pot, pot that's not purchased, obviously purchased from a government outlet. Uh, and then adults can grow up to four plants at home as long as they are not visible from public spaces. Now that's four plants per household. It's not four plants per adult, per adult in the house household. So uh, it is legal as long as it's not visible again from public spaces, you can grow up to four plants indoor or outdoor uh, on your property. There are some other limitations around. Um, so for example, if you live in shared housing, there may be limitations put on by the, by the, uh, you know, the, the housing, your, 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 uh, Anyway, those folks can put extra restrictions on, but if you own your property and you can do it in a place where people can't see it, you're allowed to grow uh, up to four plants at home for your own use. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and from that source, adults can gift up to 30 grams of dried cannabis or its equivalent to other adults. That's uh, absolutely allowed. In fact, you can mail it through the mail. You can, it's quite uh, open that way. All, most of the medical pot distributed in Canada comes through the mail um, through, from the licensed producers uh, that have been around for since around 2007, I think it started, or no, sorry. 2013, 2012, you've been able to order legally pot uh, from the government um, through the mail. Uh, and just a note about international borders, even though it's legal in British Columbia and it's legal in Washington state, you cannot cross borders with, with cannabis at all. Uh, and this has been another area where a lot of tickets have sort of started being uh, and a lot of seizures have started happening because first of all, people are more and more likely to say they're carrying it because it's legal, uh, but they get to the border and they're asked and they say yes and, and the, it's confiscated. I don't think they're ticketing very much in that, in that space, but you will, they will seize your, your products. And there's been a huge increase in that uh, in, the BC, in the border crossings in BC and other places in Canada. So just to know in, on flights, on anything that you're doing international, it's illegal to carry cannabis still. Uh, and just some some focus links. We like to, I thought we would have more employers on the on the call. Maybe some have joined. Uh, but on the Get Cannabis Clarity website, the, the link I gave you before to the government information, uh, there are some links there, and I've I've put them on here. But you can get to them easier online. Here's some uh, information for employers. Uh, there's a WorkSafe uh, document. Uh, really, it focuses more more on impairment, and that really is the issue uh, when it comes to, to uh, the substance use in the in the in the um, in the workplace. We're talking about impairment. We're talking about use that's you know affecting work. Those kinds of things. Uh, there's also something from the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health that I've linked here. Uh, that's focused on cannabis. And then the construction industry, uh, we know that the trades tend to have a lot more uh, use uh, of substances than other, uh, some other areas, uh, employment areas. But uh, here's something from uh, the construction industry of British Columbia on um, uh, testing and whatnot, uh, issues around that kind of stuff in the, in the workplace. So that's uh, all I have in terms of uh, material. I'm happy to answer questions if any have come in, not sure how that's going to work. I'm going to open up my thing here and see. Um, but yeah, happy to answer questions if you want. And that, that that is me standing next to what used to be the tallest tree in the world in California from a couple summers ago, 270 feet tall, it's a redwood, coastal redwood. So thank you, Jared. This is Sabrina again from AMSA. Um, mm -hmm. So please um, do submit your questions um, for Jared, either using the question box by tweeting us at um, AMSA, hashtag AMSA events or by emailing your questions to events at AMSA.org. And so a couple questions have come in and I'm just going to um, facilitate the Q&A session, Jared. Um, one of the questions that has come in is in regards to the alcohol measurement, um, the drink standard drink measurement that you showed earlier. Um, so one of the questions is, is this the same, like, is this the standard measurement across different countries? Um, so, and if no, um, how are people who come to BC, such as migrant workers, being educated on the fact that there is a different standard drink measurement here in British Columbia? Yeah, that's a very good question. And in fact, you're right. The, the, the definition of a standard drink varies um, by, uh, by country. Now, that's interesting, though, because what also happens is the number of drinks sort of allowed is also varied. So you're really kind of working with the same amount of alcohol. Often this, the science is the science. It's an international science base. So even though there's quite a lot of variation in the in, in what how we define standard drinks. So, for example, in the UK, the standard drink is quite a bit is a bit smaller than in Canada, but then they just give people more right you know, so there's a co is compensated in that sense it's not perfect in, in in different places you will see different uh different numbers a little bit but when we when we factor in both that the drink sizes are different and the numbers that are su suggested we're, we're we're pretty close this the, this is an international science uh it's not quite consensus but um 
that's a great question because it does vary quite a bit uh, in terms of how a drink is defined. Okay, so just to clarify, um, somebody asked, so based on the, the standard drink measurement that you, that you shared earlier, um, a pint of beer, would that then be considered 1.5 drinks? Uh, yeah, how much is a pint? I, can't, I don't have a calculator here in my head and math, but basically, yes, if you're being served more than 12 ounces of beer or if the beer is stronger, that's another trend in the industry. We have much stronger beers up to like around 8, 10% in some cases, then you need to adjust the volume to, to make that count. So, so to be technical, a standard drink in Canada is 13 uh, or 17.05 milliliters of ethanol. So what we're doing is looking at the exact alcohol content of a, of a product, and that's based on percentage of alcohol and the volume of the product. So 17.05 milliliters of ethanol is a standard drink, and that's where you see that number. That number will fall out of all that, that variation you see in the sizes and the strengths uh, across standard drinks. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, you know I, I think the norm actually out in the world is uh, is much bigger drinks than that. What people pour themselves, what they buy in a store. You know, my wife likes to drink wine, so she'll go out and, and invariably they'll offer a nine ounce glass. Of course, the incentive in the in the economic system is to get more in you because they make more money. Um, and uh, and the same with beer. When you sit down, it's almost like the default now is a pint. I think. Uh, you know, restaurants that are, 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 are doing the right thing are sort of asking, do you want a, a pint or not, instead of just bringing you a pint. Um, but we actually, Vancouver actually, in its response to alcohol, pro some of the alcohol problems there has uh, recommended, although they've not implemented, the public health folks have recommended that, that we make a standard drink, the standard drink in restaurants, and you have to ask if you want more. And I think that's a good idea, but, uh, you know, we, we can't control thousands of businesses. Uh, I guess we could, but we haven't chosen to do that. So. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Up, I'm a pint of 16 ounces. 16. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you're near, yeah, uh, four more ounces than you should have at whatever strength it is. But again, if the alcohol is stronger, you have a stronger wine, like a port, or you have, uh, you know, uh, an over, over what they call over uh, strength, uh, uh, um, um, you know, uh, what is it called? Hard alcohol, if you have it more than 40% alcohol, then you need to reduce the volume to stay in that standard drink. Okay, thank you. And also just to, for clarification, um, because many individuals here um, are supporting migrant workers, um, and so we just wanted to, to get some clarification regarding mailing cannabis. That is something that you cannot mail internationally. Yeah, that's um, right. You can only mail within Canada. <laughs> if, it, if it crosses international borders, then yeah, you could get in serious trouble. Okay, but you do not have to stay within British Columbia. It's possible to, to yeah. mail it to another province. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, you know the I think the, the 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 online government businesses that are selling pot now uh, only serve BC. You got to you got to say that you're a BC resident. Um, but if you grow some cannabis and you want to mail it to a friend in Nova Scotia, as long as it's under the thirty grams, you're good to go. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so, some a question came up of how can employers who, who employ migrant workers support them if they're noticing that they may be facing an addiction or having a substance abuse issue? You know, this is really the trick, right? And my experience with these kinds of things is uh, the deeper the addiction, the more likely they're not going to respond well. <laughs> it's just it's just the way it goes. Folks who are uh, dependent on a substance protect that choice, uh, you know, to, to extremes. And we all know this. People, if you've ever known anyone who's in an addiction, it can be very, very, very hard to approach them. So what I try to do when I'm in this place uh, is really check in with myself to, to, to be as non-judgmental as I can in that approach, just just approach it as a real true desire to sort of help uh, make it, you know, feel that way to the person you're approaching. There are techniques, you know, you can be trained to kind of do this as a counselor, for example, they call it motivational interviewing as a technique for how to, 
you just don't push, right? You, you express your concern, you offer to support, but when the defenses come up, we know the more you push in that environment, you're not gonna get anywhere. And so often what will happen is you'll, you'll sort of broach the topic, you know, you'll get to a certain point, they'll respond uh, in a way saying, don't, I don't wanna talk about this, I don't want you to do with this, but they'll go away, right? And they'll remember that you're concerned about them and they'll, they'll add that to the list of probably many people around them who are concerned. And you just, you gotta work it very, very slowly. Now, what happens often is people get so far down the road that they end up getting hurt or in trouble. And then, then there's a, you know, a real kind of natural and intervention point but it would be really nice if we could get better at sort of approaching people and supporting people to quit, you know, uh, or to help them when they're when they're having problems. Um, and and I would suggest to even do that earlier. So you know, you have an employee, they're doing great, everything's fine, and all of a sudden, you know, maybe they've got a relationship issue or something in their life that isn't going well, and then there you can see that they're coming in hungover or. You know, you get a sense. You can intervene at that point and just express concern and and you know talk about how ways to support mental health. Or you know, you can intervene before it gets to be a serious serious problem. Is my is kind of my shtick these days. We're actually trying to help the the health system do a better job of that too, particularly with alcohol. Um, to intervene before people end up, you know, in serious in serious trouble, and that's really my work for the most part. But again, if people are in serious trouble, there's there's a that link that I provided in the chat for you can you can find a place to refer. I think that's localized information. So if you're in Burnaby, you know, you can you can find places there to refer people and whatnot. But again, if somebody's not interested in getting help, intervening in a sort of heavy-handed way almost never works. And in fact, can can you know harm your relationship and those kinds of things. So just be delicate. Um, it is a bit of an art, if you will. You know, how do you how do you express that genuine concern without uh, without you know introducing that sort of judgment? Uh, there's so much stigma around these issues. So that's what I would recommend. All right, thank you, Jimmy. And a follow up question to that: um, Are there any substance abuse and addiction programs or some of these different? Um, organizations or locations that you've sent the referral links, um, are they open to individuals with precarious immigration status, such as migrant that, workers? That, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. I would, I would hope you know, that there would be a few, but I don't know for sure. You'd have to, you'd have to check into to that. Um, and again, that link that I sent, you should, you're, there should, should be a place there to ask that question. And there may be a few, uh, likely I would, I would hope there would be something like that in the Vancouver area, for example, in a, in a major center, but I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. And do you know, are there any regulations regarding employers offering alcohol or other substances to migrant workers? So for example, offering them a substance um, to you know maybe something that um you know relaxes them in terms of being able to or um or maybe they, they're not able to feel pain or um something so that they're able to to do some of the heavy um and often um challenging work that the other individuals don't want to complete so you're basically asking what is the legal status of, of giving folks substances for that purpose as an employer? Well, this in general, as an employer, um, what is is there any legal um, you know policy regarding an employer giving a migrant worker a substance um, or alcohol? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think uh, there is probably a bit of a liability. I mean, there's a reasons that, that we train doctors and authorize doctors to get involved in people's health in that way. It's, it's quite a delicate affair. So I would do that very carefully. I'm just trying to think, you know, back to my own. So if I can remember going to my boss and asking for some Advil one day because I had a headache and she gave me, <laughs> she gave me the Advil. So I guess I would, you know what I mean? I think, I think uh, I would be, cautious uh, with that approach um, if there's a health issue or a physical issue that's uh, affecting their work you know the danger would be you give them something to sort of ease the pain and then they really injure themselves right and then are you liable for that uh, outcome so I, I, I think that's a slippery slope I'd be very very cautious with that that uh, as a choice 
Okay, thank you. Um, and many migrant workers who are here in British Columbia, they, they are um, they're facing stresses as they're being isolated from their families. Um, they're facing stress um, off, um, often in their workplace um, and facing isolation being often on remote farms. Um, and so what do you have any suggestions or tips um, for these individuals and, and those supporting them that they can maybe use um, to reduce their stress and, and isolation and, and anxiety that is an alternative to a substance? Because you mentioned um, earlier that it's often um, individuals turn to substances um, mm -hmm. to overcome stress and, and other related issues. Um, what alternatives would you suggest? Yeah, so this is really, I think, the heart of the matter when it comes to addiction in society. And the way I like to think about it is really to consider connection, and I mean healthy social connection, to be the antidote to addiction. It really is. And, and one of the ways this plays out is if somebody is heading down a trajectory where their substance use is becoming more and more problematic, what you'll notice in many, in most cases, probably if not all, is they'll start social, socially isolating themselves to engage in, in the behavior. And so the antidote is healthy connection. So anything you can do, and this may not be, you know, the employer sort of uh, building a connection with uh, a migrant worker who has, you know, language issues and those kinds of things. But I would suggest if an employer can create healthy social space for the workers to, to to, to develop connections amongst themselves and, and, and also with the employer, you know, just think about connection and creating space for connection and time, you know, as best you can think about not addressing that isolation because it truly is both a, a symptom in a sense of, of problematic use and a driver of use. Uh, and, you know, I don't know exactly what that would look like, you know, uh, off work picnics, you know, sponsor a little event for the folks to come together and be social, look for those folks who may be isolating and intervene with them in particular in that way to invite them and, 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 and help them remain connected either with their coworkers or with you know, with, with you, uh, those are the kinds of things that really, really work. We're learning this with youth, for example, around prevention of substance use. If we can get them connected to a healthy adult in the school environment or in their community and amongst themselves, it really helps uh, keep people from, from, you know, going down that dark path into addiction. Well, that's what I would recommend. I don't know, you know, what that looks like practically for folks, but just something to keep in mind. Connection, healthy social connection is the antidote really to addiction. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, and there, there are some, what we've heard from, from some employers, um, but it's also from other migrant worker support organizations, settlement organizations, unions, um, professional organizations that they often will host um, some different uh, social gatherings combined with, for example, often with combined with like a health clinic, mm -hmm. um, weekends looking around, um, you know, that there was uh, a social event recently around Father's Day, um, you know, around Mother's Day, so that there are various different social events that are that are occurring. I think it's mm -hmm. great to, to keep that in mind that these social events are not just um something that are being that are kind of a nice to have um for workers but that they're also really key to combating any um potential issues um that may arise from being isolated being away from their family being in a location where they're not aware of the surroundings where with um language barriers and just having um stress so i think that's just something to think about that these are really necessary um, needed and um, that they are really one of the ways how how addiction can be prevented. You know, and it's really interesting as you think about <clears throat> the difference between you know I'm thinking about the folks that would be coming to do this work, and they often have, in my experience, they have a better handle on this stuff than we do in North America. <laughs> I think we're <laughs> we're quite socially isolated as a culture in a certain sense. We don't we don't do this very well. I'm just thinking about my own workplace. You know, we do a couple events a year kind of thing, 
uh, and they're not generally very well attended either. <laughs> but maybe if you can tap into that, that I would suggest even, you know, more capable social uh, uh, culture, actually, of some of these folks and just get them really, you know, get some keeners really involved in helping. So it's not this, you know, us trying to trying to create space for them, but really involving them in that process and bringing that that cultural awareness of connection and healthy connection through uh, into these events would be a really good idea too. Um, we have a few more minutes with you before um, we'll be going to the, our next presentation. Um, so one of the questions that, that came up was um, you provided uh, some resources regarding um, alcohol um, reality check. The, the question was, do some of these resources also exist in other languages? Have they been translated? Are there mm. documents and resources that can be used so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, I think that uh, you can take down the name here to help.ca. Uh, that's a, a website where I'm pretty sure some translation has been done. I'm not sure about the alcohol reality check. You can go to that website and, and see. I'm not sure if that one in particular has been, but I, I'm pretty sure the Here to Help website has resources in various language, languages, and they'll have something probably similar to this, uh, uh, to the reality check. I just know the reality check because I know the people who developed it and I like it. I think it's, I, I often share it in these kind of experiences because I think it's good for all of us to sort of think about our drinking. Uh, you know, alcohol is a, a funny one because it's so socially accepted uh, that it's, it, there's a lot of social space to sort of let your use sort of creep up into, into the not so healthy range before anybody says anything because everyone does it. It's, you know, it's so common. So that one in particular, I think people need need a little bit of uh, specificity around how do I keep a tra keep track of my drinking to make sure it's not becoming problematic. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, and we'll look to share um, all the different links and and website resources that were mentioned when we also send out the evaluation email following this webinar. So we will we will ensure to include that as well. Um, just one question regarding alcohol and I, I do think that it is um, because it's so socially accepted and that there's that there's a lot of conflicting health advice that, that individuals hear. Um, so on the one hand um, it's stated that um, that it's best to avoid alcohol and that it's you know it's better for the body not to have alcohol and then on the other hand it's often um, you hear that having a glass of wine um, has health benefits um, could you maybe um, provide some clarity or insight on this debate? Absolutely. And, the, and the, 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 the deciding factor here is the amount. What happens for a lot of people is they have a drinking style. I know people who drink a whole bottle of wine after work every night. And they say, oh, that must be healthy. Not the case, right? If you want to optimize the health benefits and they're not for everyone, it's mainly for heart, heart disease is where you get the, the biggest uh, effect. And that, you know, the issue scientifically is that heart disease is a very big deal in our society. So a small effect in that area affects health a lot. So this is what you hear in the news. It's good for you, it's good for you, it's good for you. Basically, yes, but if you want to optimize the health benefits of alcohol, you should drink less than a drink a day average. It's not a bottle of wine after work every day, right? So less than a drink, a little less than a drink a day is where the health benefits of alcohol are, are, are uh, optimized. And again, it's not for everyone, it's for healthy adults uh, who don't have addictions issues in their family or their past, it's, it's, it's not for everyone. But if, if you're interested in, in this issue, then it's very, very light consumption. No more than less less than a drink a day average is where that that effect is is, is is optimized. And you know, again, most people will just kind of map onto their use and say it must be good for me, which is not the case. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jared. Thank you for providing um, all these different answering all the different questions that have come up, um, providing clarity, um, and and kind of providing some more information from from the research perspective um, on on this challenging and important topic so thank you so much for for joining us
You're very welcome. And uh, again, just kudos to you all for considering this as an issue. Again, I think this population, I know this population is vulnerable. One thing we understand about addiction uh, substance use is that, that uh, drink for drink, toke for toke, poor people, people of less economic means, uh, accrue more harm. It's more harmful. Their use is more harmful uh, than folks who have more uh, economic means to sort of address their, you know, compensate for their use. So I think this is a really, really important topic for this group. And again, thank you so much for considering it. Well, thank you, Jared. And we're going to now move over to um, our next uh, set of presenters. And so our, our and I'll just like to introduce them first. So I'll be introducing Tejinder Gill, Luce Marina, and Varinder Kamboy. Tejinder Gill has been working in the social services field for the past 22 years. He has worked with youth in residential treatment and also as a youth worker. He has been part of Diversity Community Resources Society as a substance use counselor for the past 10 years, working with the South Asian community. He is also a certified drug and alcohol counselor. Our second speaker in this trio of, of speakers coming up is Luz Marina, who has a master's degree in counseling psychology and is a registered clinical counselor with the BC Association of Clinical Counselors. This has been working at diversity for the past 27 years and has been actively involved in the Hispanic community, providing counseling to children, teens, adults, and families. Luz has experience working with refugees and immigrants within their cultural value system and her clinical experience on mental health issues, including substance use. Our final speaker in this trio of speakers is Varinder Kamboy. Varinda has completed his doctoral degree in social work in India in 2008. He worked with sex workers and injected drug users in India for a few years. Varinda has completed his master's degree in social work at the University of British Columbia and is a registered social worker with the British Columbia College of Social Workers. He has recently worked in programs funded by the Ministry of Children and Family Development and is currently working with Diversity Community Resources Society as a substance use counselor. So I would like to welcome our, our three speakers um, for our next presentation as part of this webinar session. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you for having us. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Tejinder Gill and I was going to talk a little bit about what is an addiction. Addiction are defined as a uh, Canadian based and also from a uh, multicultural based, how they define drinking and drug use in the community. It is defined as a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by a compulsive drug seeking and use. Despite harmful consequences, it is considered a brain disease because drugs can change the brain. They change its structure and how it works. These brain changes can be long lasting, can lead to the harmful behaviors seen in people who abuse drugs. Another a simpler form of addiction could be addiction is anything that takes over your life. You can't do anything about it. Example for drinking, people drink every day and night. Drugs and alcohol come before family, work, everything in your life. We talk about uh, stages of addiction. There are many, there are many types that come about. For example, is uh, and the stages of what is addiction, uh, the first one, some people, there's five categories for uh, substance use. One is no use. People choose not to use substance because of personal health reasons. The risks, there is none. Experimentation is uh, when someone's using like a teenager, a young person, they're experimenting maybe with cannabis or with uh, drinking the first time in their life. They might try because they might be curious. They can be fun. Might be influenced by friends or peers risk-taking behaviors. At the beginning, when you start doing this, there's few problems associated with it, but there's also a danger of overdose and accident due to lack of experience. Sometimes uh, young people can overdose on a substance uh, which they never tried before, and it can lead to like going to the hospital or even dying and stuff. A non-problem use is uh, someone who's a social drinker. They drink from very, they vary from just special occasions to regularly use small amounts. Enjoy small amount of social, social situations. Example of that maybe every Friday comes along, they might have a glass of wine, maybe have a beer or have one spirit with their dinner and they go, I'm good. 
and they do that once a week. That's called moderate drinking. Uh, the risk of it could be impaired driving, like uh, zero, zero tolerance for uh, drinking driving. Never combine uh, alcohol or drugs with medication. Uh, misuse is uh, when people used to drink on weekends. Uh, they continue to use because uh, they enjoy getting drunk or high with their friends or their associates, often with the company of their peers. Uh, usually they drink Friday and Saturday. Sunday they just kind of take it easy because they don't have to go back and work on Mondays. The problem is to rise here. Uh, your schoolwork, everything else gets impacted. This is that uh, they drink uh, quite frankly on a daily basis. Some of the signs and symptoms of addiction are Feel, people feel guilty, uh, changing in their eating, 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 changing eating habits, they're not eating as much. Uh, some people drink or use drugs to get away from troubles or difficulties. Uh, people have financial difficulties. Uh, once they stop drinking, they can't stop. That's usually a sign someone's got a problem with alcohol misuse. Is, uh, once they started, they said, I'm gonna have one or two, but it continues on for a long period of time. And a lot of people who use drugs or alcohol, they tend to spend time with friends who use. And uh, another sign of symptom is missing work, missing uh, important engagements, such as maybe a wedding, kids' school activities, or other family things might come up. And people also isolate themselves. They keep secret about their activities. Uh, they really, they're not really interested in talking to anybody anymore. The sleep pattern gets disrupt, disrupted. They only sleep a certain number of hours at nighttime. They get up early. A lot of them have legal problems with the criminal justice system, maybe. And also, uh, drug use and alcohol misuse can uh, impact family relationships, marriage relationships, also with their kids. Right? Some of the signs of uh, some of the signs of drug drinking is uh, what we notice is uh, these questions we always ask to clients, especially South Asian clients: Is uh, do you drink alone? Do you ever feel guilty after drinking? Does drinking getting get in the way of healthy eating and exercise? Do you have to drink to get away from life's family, from, from difficulties from work, difficulties? Uh, once you start, you know, but also uh, you have to drink in social situations. You know, we're gonna go to a party, we're gonna go to someone's house or in a wedding or something. We need to have a drink before we go, just to feel comfortable. And uh, the major one is that has drinking led us or using drugs led us going to the hospital, getting arrested, losing your job. Does your family say you drink too much? These are signs of a severe drinking. This is someone who's a heavy drinker. Heavy drinkers use to find as someone who drinks on a daily basis. How are we looking at it in the Canadian society and also with the South Asian community? We also define someone who's the severe drinking is they're drinking. Uh, day in day out they're at the liquor store nine in the morning they're on the street they don't work they have no friends and uh, they drink but the truth the honest truth is that uh, someone who usually drinks they usually drink in the evening time uh usually after work uh, the Canadian studies are so on seven out of ten people that drink alcohol or use drugs they usually do in the evening time uh, the reason they can't use drugs or alcohol in the daytime because they're at work and most people go home and drink the evening and uh, they all, they're all functioning, they all have friends, they have family, they have jobs, they all have houses. And uh, some of the signs of severe drinking, people get hallucinations. They start seeing doubles, they might be start talking to themselves. They're always sweating, like uh, sweating a lot, like you go at a gym or a workout. And uh, two common symptoms of someone with alcohol miss severe drinking issue is, uh, one is uh, having a memory impairment where they drank the night before, but they can't remember. But it comes, the gaps get filled in a couple of days later when someone might call them, say, hey, you're doing this. The memory come back. It's called a memory uh, impairment. And the blackout is uh, where a person is drank till a certain time, certain time of the night. They can't remember what they did for that one or two hours. It's like when you go in a movie theater, you go to the washroom, you missed a scene, and you come back, we missed that part. That's what a blackout is. And we usually tell people who are clients we're working with, we're having a blackout. It tells you that uh, the brain is telling you that, hey, there's something, there's some major health issues going on and you need to stop using or drinking especially. Uh, people get mood swings. Uh, they're happy. They're irritated. They get depressed quite quickly. 
and quite get anxious. You don't know what kind of a mood they're in. They're always uh, quite upset or angry. You might ask them, how is it going? They might get very defensive of that. A lot of people get depression because alcohol is a depressant and also some other drugs are depressed, like opiate drugs. They depress the brain. And also people get anxiety. Another one is people are chronically fatigued. They're always tired. They don't know what's going on. Their body's always breaking down. They have no energy. And they're always tired every day, day in, day out. And another common thing for drinking is a lot of people's hands, they shake. Your hands shake in the morning, you're going through a withdrawal. That's a serious problem where uh, people drink on a daily basis in the evening. In the morning time, they usually have a drink just to feel comfortable. And their hands shake also as part of the withdrawal. And also a lot of people, go, diarrhea can be happening. Uh, there's a loss of uh, sex drive. And also there's a recurrent, intoxic recurrent intoxication. What that basically means is that uh, someone, uh, they might have stopped drinking for like one or two days, a couple of days, but they smell, the body still smells like it. These are some of the signs of uh, severe drinking at the present time. With substance use, uh, it's very similar. Uh, a high risk if you're uh, injecting drugs is a risk of infectious diseases. If you smoke drugs, it can impact the brain development as well too, especially with uh, young people. Uh, with uh, the studies that have shown that the brain develops to the age of 25. If you have a young person who starts using drugs, for example, cannabis or other drugs at the age of 13, sometimes the development of the brain stops and it can cause some, can cause some severe health, health issues and mental health issues for young people as well too. Uh, next slide. Hi, uh, my name is Brenda. To begin with, I would like to share my experiences as an immigrant. I landed in Canada with a master's degree in social work and seven years of work experience. I started my career in Canada with a job where I used to work as a clerk, as a clerk within, a, within a, an organization. I tried very hard to get back to school to have Canadian education and experience, but it was very difficult for me to go back to school. I volunteered with the Vancouver Coastal Health for one year, and it took me two years to enter in UBC to do my master's again. So during this period of time, I have experienced emotional ups and downs. I felt broken sometimes, but I was very clear with my goals, which encouraged me to be strong. So being a, being a landed immigrant, I was able to access all the services. But when we look at the people who are temporary migrant workers here, their situation is way tougher than mine or any other landed immigrant. So there are various reasons why they, they, they are addicted, why they start using their uh, substances or alcohol. So one of them is social isolation. Back home, people were living with their families. They had strong bonding in the community. From South Asian perspective, people live in a joint family system where they all support each other in tough times. Emotionally, they are so strong that they don't have to worry about anything. But when it comes to Canada, they are in different country, they are in different world, where people doesn't have time to interact with each other. So I believe that's the main reason for their uh, uh, substance misuse or addiction. So they try to cope up with their emotions by using uh, substances or alcohol. So another thing is living arrangements. Most of the people have their own homes back home, but when they land here, they have to find place to live. Sometimes they are promised by their, their uh, employers that they will provide them uh, living facilities, but usually that's not the case. And they have to find their own place and they have to adjust with the, with the circumstances. So living expenses are very high and they have to find places where they can save some money. Another thing is that they have back home, they were not doing the, the home stuff because their wives or their family members were dealing with that. But when they come, to, when they come there, cooking, cleaning, and everything they will have to do because, because they don't have support here. So some of them, they might have a bad migration experiences so which can lead them to uh, addiction as well. For an example, uh, there might be some unhealthy work conditions. There are some people, I have few clients, they work longer longer hours than they are assigned. 
so they work 12 14 hours every day so end of the day so they feel they feel tired so then they use uh, alcohol or substances to cope up with their uh, with their uh, tiredness so another thing is language barriers people sometimes feel ignored and isolated due, due to lack of communication skills so language plays very important role here so they don't feel included sometimes and uh, and, and also we talked about current uh, employment work condition might not be good some people uh, some people they don't like work because back home when they were applying for their immigration so they they might have different perspective they might have different uh, uh, scenario but when they come here they have to work longer hours they have to uh, work every day seven days a week so that might be the, the struggle for them so there are a lot of cultural differences which can lead them to start drinking. So cultural shock is uh, the main thing because back home, the culture is totally different. Uh, even if we talk about culture, work culture, it's totally different here. Back home, the work is very, very relaxing. They can, it's not like, uh, I would say target based, but when they come here, it's totally target based. So it becomes difficult for, for them to, to cope up with the work conditions. So another thing is previous use of uh, substances. So history of uh, uh, substance misuse also play a very important role in one's life. So a person who, is, who has used substances in the past, so to these above mentioned reason can lead them to drink again. So that might be another reason. So another thing is peer pressure. All these people, they are struggling with their life, day-to-day -day life. And when they still, they live with the people and all of them are drinking or using some kind of substances. So that peer pressure can lead them to uh, use substances. So I would, I would like to share an uh, example of one of my clients. So he was uh, living with the five other uh, gentlemen. So when, when he, they all were using some kind of substances but he was sitting home and he felt isolated he felt ignored and then he thought i should have a drink with them or use some kind of substances this is how he started and once he started the, the people who were sitting with them they forced him to drink again they forced him to use substances again and again so that led him to addiction and another thing is social comparison. Some some of uh, South Asian, I will, I will talk about South Asian population because I have worked with them. So some of them, so th when they look at other people who are from their villages, who are from their cities, sometimes they start comparing themselves with those people. They are having luxury cars, they are having big houses though. So when they start comparing themselves, they felt sad inside and that might, be another reason to lead them to uh, to addiction. So next slide, please. What happens if, if someone is uh, looking for help? When someone has a substance use problem, these are some of the signs that you look. You need help. Someone's feeling sick. They're having health problems. For example, is that uh, they're going, uh, they're throwing up. They're going through withdrawals. Their hands are shaking. They're going through physical pain. That's usually a sign that they're addicted to drugs. Uh, the pain is unmanageable, we should seek medical help. Having suicide thoughts, people want to do self-harm or think that they're giving up on everything. And also self-harm, hurting themselves through maybe uh, injections or other types of uh, substance use, they don't, they've kind of given up. And also suffering uh, serious withdrawal effects, serious self-harm withdrawals is someone's addicted, let's say opium medication, after developing an addiction, they're going through a serious withdrawal 68 hours later, which is basically a flu, but 100 times worse. They're normal cold. And also the alcohol misuse is that your hands are shaking severely and you're having a lot of hangovers and stuff. You're injured, you're falling down, or your family or friends are asking you to stop drinking or stop using. These are all signs that you should seek some immediate help get other to other places in there. Just with, uh, this way, we work with the South Asian community here, the Spanish-speaking community quite a bit. And a lot we work, uh, this is my experience, uh, Tijana Gill here, I uh, just work over 10 years with diversity every day as a substance counselor. You've seen uh, a lot of clients come in here, and a lot of them are uh, migrant workers we've had experience with, 
and also being permanent residents to Canada or being in the country for, for, for a few years. Uh, most of them cases are for alcohol misuse. They all come in and say, hey, look, we don't, uh, we don't use uh, drugs. We don't smoke. We don't do this, that. We just drink alcohol on a daily basis. When we talk about drinking on a daily basis is a lot of them don't drink during the daytime. It's usually in the evening time. It's usually heavy drinking. How we define heavy drinking usually is uh, six ounces or higher. Most of these clients average about a Mickey a day, which is about 13 ounces of alcohol. And we tell them that's a serious health issue. And they say, no, it's okay. Because they're understanding from uh, understanding background that alcohol is good for your health. Nothing bad comes out of it because we don't use other drugs. And also we talked with the vendor I had mentioned just earlier also was that most of the clients that I worked with have, have got into like an opiate addiction or cocaine. Hard drugs compared to alcohol. A lot of them never used back home in Punjab. Uh, they came here to use because they're isolated from their family, their friends, their peers, adjusting to a new Canadian life. When they come back home from, uh, they live very comfortable because there's family support around them. They have like 20, 30 extended family members and all their, all their roots are there. Come into Canada and just like go to work right away. And what they do is they kind of, they're lonely, they're very vulnerable. These are usually males we work with. And what they all say is that, hey, I was working in the construction industry on the farm. Someone said, hey, take this pill, you'll feel better. And all of a sudden they feel great. All their stress, their emotions, their feelings, whatever negative is going on, it's all blocked out because they got a temporary release. And after a while, they actually get addicted to the substance. When they come see us, we actually have to explain to them what their drug is, what they're using, because they have no idea. They think they're doing cocaine, but they're actually doing heroin and stuff. And uh, yeah, that's what we noticed in that, especially with the opiate crisis going on. Uh, I've seen the migrant workers, uh, we've seen the people working in the agriculture field, or even the greenhouses in the lower mainland here in the Fraser Health. Yeah, in the truth, uh, in the construction sector, you see a lot of uh, men using opiate medication, opiate drugs, but also in the migrant workers that work in the farming, you see a lot of women as well, older women using uh, Tylenol 3. They use other medicine just to numb their uh, physical pain and they think it's okay. And it's a, it's a hidden, hidden underground section, but a lot of uh, substance use just to deal with uh, like med medicine or drugs or alcohol just to deal with everyday working long hours, like a lot of these uh, people who work in market workers, they're working between 12 to 16 hours a day and it's seven days a week. And some of them feel isolated, lonely, and are fatigued and they feel, hey, take some medicine or take some drugs or drink alcohol. It's a good way to block things out and feel okay. The next slide, please. Good morning. My name is Luz Marina. And I am the Spanish speaking substance counselor at Diversity. I'll be talking today about the role of staff working with the migrant workers. The, I think the very important issue over here is building a report. This is crucial in all our uh, job for settlement workers, for frontline workers, for uh, counselors. Building a report is very, very important. Um, we need to be respectful with everybody, listen to them, uh, provide safe environment to talk, give them opportunity to speak and very important is to talk to them about or to let them to talk about their emotions these people come with very very uh, uh, emotional issues they leave their, their families in their countries and as we are saying over here sometimes they are completely isolated they have support to each other they support each other yes but they are missing the most important aspect in our lives, which is the family. Another aspect which is important when we are building a report is to clarify them the confidentiality issue. Confidentiality issue is very, very important because they are sometimes they are afraid to talk about who, who are these people, 
and they are afraid maybe if I talk about that I am drinking, may are, maybe they are going to deport me, maybe they are going to tell me no, no more work. So they are very afraid. So very important to clarify them. What is the issue of confidentiality? And at the same time, let them know that they come because we want to help them. We are not going to criticize them because they, 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 they have those kind of things. Maybe they are going to criticize me. Maybe they are going to judge me. No, this is nothing that we are going to do. In the report, everybody knows, and we it's more like being with the client and listening to them. The aspect of screening and assessments, we have various tools uh, are available for screening and assessment. If you are not familiar with those, you can refer the client to appropriate services. The assessment helps us to understand the client's current needs, which should be addressed. Assessment, like I, sometimes we ask them for how long have they been drinking, we, at what age they start drinking, who are their supports, those kind of things are very important in the assessment. Emotional support and educational, education and awareness. I'm going to put them these together because the emotional support is what we do, is to open the door to our clients, to anybody, not only migrant workers, but everybody, refugees, permanent residents, Canadian citizens, is to give them the support, uh, being with the client, be empathetic to the client. And we need to connect them with the places where we can have emotional support sometimes. We have to refer them to groups. They, some people need to have that kind of like a sense that I am not the only one. There are other people who are in the same way as me, so I can have that kind of support. Education and awareness, very important. Uh, if you find that the client is problem, Try to educate them about addiction or con very important, connect them to counseling. Explain them what is about the, the, the part that they are gonna get if they go to counseling. At least somebody will understand them and will listen to them. Creating a healthy support network and integrated team approach, the same come together. It's more like a, the peer support Settlement workers play a very, very important role in, in this part because they, they can listen to them. They can give them like a, the appropriate referrals, where to go as support. Um, even like integrating the team approach, uh, it may include the settlement worker, the counselor, sometimes the employer, social worker, medical, professional. If, they, if the client requires inpatient support, they can be referred to residential treatment centers. This is something that we do internally in the agency. Trauma-informed care. Some clients may have past trauma, which lead them drink. So uh, we have to give them resources, not just addiction and mental health is, um, giving them more like a, a information about where to go, how to participate in the community, go to uh, soccer clubs, go to the gym, connecting them to temples, to churches, wellness centers is very, very important. Helping them to access library, recreation centers is another way that we can give them support a food bank, a shelter. Um, it's, it's like a information and orientation to, to them. Uh, we've been talking about like uh, the language barrier, and yes, they definitely they have a language barrier. Everybody knows that. Uh, a diversity, we have been working very, very close with the Mexican consulate and some Hispanic churches. And we provide them some kind of like a, a information a, through workshops and as a, a gender 
and Barin, they were talking about it. They were very, very hard. They have they spend like at sometimes six, seven days a week, long hours. And sometimes the migrant workers say, if we talk about, for example, the farm work, time to to spend like uh, socializing with other which well sometimes it is good but as the gender was saying uh, they drink in the evenings and this is true because they are having some kind of like a maybe a support among themselves by drinking and um, in one of my workshops that we did for the Mexican consulate I remember that the farm workers identify some gaps and everybody knows about this the gap one of the gaps that they identify is the lack of access to english programs this usually this issue usually is covered by volunteers from churches or some volunteers in the community these people don't have access to go for english classes basic basic when we talk about english classes i'm talking about more like a basic english classes like maybe going to the store how to buy this or even like a giving them in english like uh, uh, i feel sick and very very simple words they don't have access and they were talking about that they don't have access but it's covered by volunteers uh, from churches and or sometimes volunteers in the community and as we were saying before lack of family support during the time they are working in canada farm workers farm workers uh, people from Mexico, from Guatemala, they come sometimes for eight, ten months with a special contract, but they don't have the families. And this is very, very like an uh, uh, issue. They, they miss their families. Uh, according to them, according to the uh, farm workers, they say that they receive support from the consulates and the private sponsors. And most probably they do. They do because it's a special contract and the consulate usually they give them the support of like uh, the houses, the medical issues. But if one migrant worker comes, we know that we have to open the doors to them and with a lot of empathy, understanding, um, which is very important. And, and at the same time, that's the reason that we have to work together. We have the agencies need to work together. If we know that there is another agency providing services for these people, refer them. So, and working together very important. Work, uh, we need to have excellent network with the organizations, excellent network with the consulates. Um, and as we do, provide the excellent services to everybody, to refugees, new migrants, permanent residents, Canadian citizens, and the immigrant workers. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it was very uh, important for us to give you this. Is that Ginger Gill? Looking at our time, we've got about nine minutes left. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is outpatient counseling. So, over at like part of Diversity Community Resource Society, we're a multicultural based, community based organization. I think we serve over 12 languages. And uh, for the for our for the substance use counseling program, which is funded by Fraser Health, we serve the Spanish speaking community. We also spoke, we also serve the South Asian community, which is a uh, Hindi speaking. Urdu speaking and Punjabi speaking. We serve clients that are permanent residents, refugees, uh, clients that are naturalized Canadian citizens or uh, individuals born here. We do have the ability to work with people that are students and also uh, migrant workers like temporary foreign working. They're here on a temporary basis. We will work with anybody at the, at the capacity that we have. Uh, just with our, our substance counseling program, the Spanish speaking Spanish speaking counseling program is the only one in the lower mainland that offers drug and alcohol counselor in the Fraser Health region. And also with our outpatient counseling program, Diversity Community Resource Society, we provide a one-to-one -one counseling. We provide group counseling. Our uh, program is fit for client needs. We be providing uh, group counseling on Sundays. Majority of the South Asian clients and many of the Spanish speaking clients they they tend to work during the work during the during the weekday and the only time usually 
evening time the time they have off so we usually hear uh monday through sunday except for saturdays offering outpatient counseling for them in our role uh, the most important relationship we can build with a client is just open communication a lot of these clients have nobody to talk to in their accounts in their background when one when one individual walks through the door it's a lot of that's a lot of courage because we talk about privacy and confidentiality they don't want nobody to know that they have a, a drug or an alcohol problem when they come in we greet them we meet with them we talk to them about confidentiality what their rights are and what we can do to support them in our role as counselors we provide uh we, we provide referrals to uh, residential treatment that are funded by Fraser Health Public. We also help the clients get on income assistance. We also provide clients with other support services in the community. And we help them find work sometimes, a whole bunch of things. But basically, a lot of our job is psychoeducation and uh, just building rapport with the client because the client usually has, has had, had a bad experience in Canada when they first come. So that's one of the things I'm gonna do with outpatient counsel, provide one-to-one, -one. we do group counseling. For example, for our South Asian clients, we run a group on Sundays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. It's usually a lot of men that come. Uh, the men usually have main, main choice of substances, alcohol, and we just provide a basic a psychoeducation group. We have about a 15 to 20 clients. Uh, Sundays really works good for them. A lot of them work uh, Monday through Saturday, six days a week, usually 10 to 12 hours. And uh, a lot of them tend to reduce their drinking. We're a harm reduction program. Uh, we're not absent-based. We, we work with what the client needs what their needs are. A lot of the clients have said that uh, like family is very important. They don't have any uh, coping skills when you're dealing with them. English is a language barrier. A lot of them can't read or write English and a lot of them are literate. If you, they walk into a hospital for help, there's nobody that serves a language. A lot of things can happen. A lot of the clients are very traumatized. They've been through a lot of trauma. We talked about those bringing on myself and Brenda, a lot of the clients we work with. Then we don't want to talk about their past because they've all they've all just keep kept it buried inside and a lot of them self-medicate. Uh, that's outpatient counseling at diversity community resource site. It's free, it's confidential, and uh, it's from all walks of life, especially backgrounds. We do work with clients that are in the Canada for temporary or for migrant workers or even students that come in. So our agency has been very open to, open to that, to helping them and supporting them at, at the present time. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Roshni Clinic. So this clinic is a new initiative by Fraser Health. So Fraser Health has uh, um, planned this clinic with, uh, with the uh, help of, uh, help of um, diversity. So we provide counseling in this clinic. So how does this, that clinic work? we have some addiction doctors in that clinic so they speak Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu and English so this clinic is specifically for a South Asian community so what happens when a client walks in South Asian clients walks in he see the doctor first and then he see the counselor so in counseling we provide one-to-one -one counseling we provide family counseling counseling as well so we have group uh, every Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. So pro approximately around 12 to 15 people are attending that group. Uh, also, we have started another group um, for uh, substance use affected family members. So that group, we run that group every Sunday from 3 to 4 p.m. So a lot of, um, uh, it's for uh, women only. So a lot of uh, uh, South Asian women are joining that group. So this is how we try to help them with the, uh, at the uh, Roshni Clinic. Uh, another thing is Creekside Detox. So if a patient, if a person, if a client is looking for help, so she can go for a Creekside Detox. How does that work? They need to call at their phone number and then they can book them, book the client in for uh, inpatient detox. So similarly, when Google Detox is there, and detox program is there as well in Surrey. Uh, there are NA and A meetings available. So whatever time suits the clients, so they can visit, they can see those, uh, they can attend those meetings. So there are some residential treatment options available uh, for the patients who are seeking help. So one of them is a Maple Ridge Treatment Center. So 
if they want to, if they feel, if they really feel sick, if they think that they cannot control their uh, their drinking, so that's another option. So we can help them with the uh, with the paperwork and uh, everything. So that's all from our side. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you to um, Tarjan and Harinder for pre presenting. And so um, I'm just going to explain how you can submit questions as we're coming now to the to the second and final Q and A portion of today's webinar. So please type your question into the question box on the right hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel. You can tweet your questions using the hashtag AMSA events. Or alternatively, you can email your, your um, questions to events at amsa.org. So um, I'm just going to pose a question. I'm not sure uh, to Ginger, Lucer, or Rinder, um, who, who would be most uh, suited and who would like to, to answer the questions. Um, but the, the one question that um, that's come up is, how can a person um, who is providing services and support to migrant workers um, identify that there may be a substance abuse issue. Um, and this, is there something in particular that, that individuals should be looking out for? Um, one, one thing they can look out for is uh, just a change of behavior, you know what I mean? If they're working every day, they're not getting up in the morning, they're missing work. Also with mood swings and how they're feeling as well, if they're isolating themselves, they're not really communicating, maybe a lack of sleep, loss of weight as well can be as well, and not eating maybe. Those are some symptoms as well. Someone can look for like a hangover, like you're tired, you're fatigued, like uh, you're not very kind of moody as well in the morning, and also uh, very tired. Those are some early signs of uh, there might be something going on with uh, substance misuse. Okay, thank you. Um, and Rinder, um, what are some tips or suggestions that you could share um, for migrant workers who are feeling stressed and, and, and experiencing that isolation that are an alternative to a substance? Well, to release stress, I, I think we have to help them with information, like uh, maybe some recommendations, some tips, participation in the community. Unfortunately, well, they work very hard every day, but Saturdays, uh, some of, uh, for example, if I talk about the Mexican farm workers, I see that some of them, I don't know about their schedule, but some farm workers have like a Sundays off, and Sundays off, they dedicated to buy their own groceries. But this is the day that maybe we have to give them some kind of like information, like go for a, like especially at this time of the year, going to a community events, like uh, um, events in parades or uh, churches, uh, groups, even uh, the, 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 the settlement workers needs to needs, needs a special role on this part. Information about even what is the gym or go to the library, access something and uh, and talk to them about like uh, stress. Everybody uh, experiences stress. What can we do to do to release that? Go for short walks. Uh, to give them some kind of like, uh, we, we provide that in our workshop, some kind of like mindfulness, uh, meditation, uh, breathing exercises, and the most important part, talk to somebody else. Talk to, the, talk to your best friend, or even if they feel free to try to talk to the, sometimes even the employer, well, the employer, may have some kind of like a resources for them. But it releases stress, uh, I mean like a, it's appropriate information and encouragement. Encouragement and obviously like uh, identifying what is what is causing them. This kind is a lot of work that they are doing, or more like identification and at the same time giving them the tools. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for that answer. Um, and for the next question, I'm gonna ask 
um, the, the individual asked you to be as concrete and to provide as many examples as possible. Um, but how would you start a conversation with a client on um, how to access help if they seem to be having a substance um, abuse issue? So how would you start that conversation? What are some of the, the sentences that you would use? Uh, by the time to gender girl, yeah. So we get a lot of referrals coming from the hospital, for example, you know what I mean? The hospital send us a referral someone well we come in uh, we just ask when a person comes in sometimes they're mandated by you know probation industry or uh just off the community because they're suffering from something the doctor will refer them so when they come and see us a uh, concrete question is like first question they ask like we speak in our cultural language so that's the language so the cultural piece is very important they can relate to someone who's similar to their cultural background and the language background and also treating them with a like, human dignity First, we ask them, like, hey, how are you doing? How's it going? Come into our office, have a seat. Try to make them feel comfortable. We support them basically by saying, hey, we're so glad that you're able to come and see us today, right? Most of them are usually sent. We come in, we say, make yourself comfortable. We explain what confidentiality is. Like, what if you talk about stays here, doesn't go to the room, unless it's, you know, someone self-harming behavior or, uh, you know, someone's like a, a young person under the age of 19. We have to report that. So we kind of start with that. We kind of ask them like, hey, how you been? How long you been in the country for? What are some things you like to do? When we ask that, like, what are some of your hobbies? Is that uh, the substance use is, uh, we talk about at the end, we just get to know the individual first. Because the client that we're talking to, they're very surprised we give them positive feedback. Hey, you're working full time. You made it to Canada, right? Best place in the world in our opinion, right? And uh, What's going on? Like, you know, what, what have you been doing? What do you think about your family? And, uh, you know, you're a good person. There's a lot of positive uh, positive reinforcement, building their self-esteem, the first, making that connection with them. And uh, these, and after you make that connection, they open up quite openly right away, right away because most of the clients are a multicultural base. They never really had the opportunity to speak to someone besides a family member. And uh, you just build that rapport with them because a lot of them have a lot of negative experiences and they release all their negative energy, what they're going through, usually one session. One or two sessions, they open it up. You notice a big difference in them right away. That's what we notice with the association community. Does that answer that question? Um, I'll ask the individual if it doesn't ask, answer their question fully, just to please um, provide some more clarity and, and, and pose a follow-up question in the question box. But... Um, it kind of raised another question for some individuals. Um, what tips or suggestions would you have for an individual who is supporting a migrant worker? So it could be a settlement worker, somebody working uh, for a migrant worker support organization, or any other organization who's supporting that migrant worker. Um, and they've, they've noticed that that individual migrant worker um, has a substance abuse issue. Um, however, that, that migrant worker does not want to receive support or help um, for that, how can that um, individual who's supporting the migrant worker also ensure that they're taking them care of themselves and doing proper self-care that they um, so that they're um, not being impacted? Yeah, just so that, that's a very tough question. Is uh, if a client is not really engaged in the process, but the best communication would be that settlement worker continue continue working with that client working on their strength and what they can offer. Just adding input, hey, I know that you're struggling with substance abuse. If you're interested, these are the resources that are available in the community. We get a lot of clients that come in denial as well too. They don't want help or support or service. They say they're okay. And the biggest thing we work with settlement work in the past is just uh, keeping that connection open. They're like, how come they're not changing? How come they're changing? Because like we said, uh, addiction is a uh, health issue, right? The health issue is a disease, and uh, a lot of times we want the client to change, but not, they're not going to change. That's why they're coming for help. And having connection with that's the most important piece. Uh, we've had a lot of times where clients continue to drink or use drugs. They're not willing to change, but you still continue to see them. And you work with them, and you build a rapport with them, and maybe hopefully... Um, and thank you for that, but could you also provide that <laughs> answer from the perspective of 
it's it's not the the client, the migrant worker who who's the focus of it, but it's that individual who's that support person, that settlement worker who um who are who is being impacted um due to the fact that they are supporting and helping that migrant worker. How can they um if if they're a settlement worker, a migrant worker, support worker, how can they ensure that they're taking care of themselves and not just focusing on taking um supporting that migrant worker? Oh, that's a great that self-care is very important. We have that is uh for a settlement worker, uh, they work every day, they work very hard working on the front line. One thing suggestion for a settlement worker would be self-care would be like exercising, uh going to the gym, also maybe talking to your uh, manager, you know what I mean? Or going through an EA, a, EAP program as well. And uh when you're when you're done work, you're off, you're off. It's not a take care of the migrant working and all their needs because they're individual you support them best you can self-care is very important maybe uh talking to a colleague is very important as well too but also if you have a clinical supervisor or a manager and also case management is very important maybe see who else is involved with the settlement worker if there's another another body of agency involved in the community working together and uh, not to take it personal when they don't want to quit you can't change someone it's up to them right and uh, going home relaxed because if the settlement worker is stressed out and not at their best, how are they going to go support that client in that moment as well too? So self-care is important, like exercising and working out, maybe talking to your manager, maybe bringing up at a clinical meeting internally. If you're a big organization, maybe you work with other people together how you can support this individual as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and the individual who posed the question earlier, um, asking for how to start the conversation um, in terms of a client accessing and accessing help, um, you mentioned you, you you answered the question from that referral perspective. Um, but the individual's asking and would appreciate having an answer. It's not from a referral. So you're not even aware if this individual has a substance abuse issue or not. It's something that you're maybe throughout the conversation, um, maybe you've worked with them for a little while, that it's something that you're assuming, mm -hmm. um, but you're not quite certain. And so how would you approach that conversation and kind of open up that door and in, in the conversation, but where you're still trying to navigate, um, does this person really need support or not? We, we were talking about like a building a good rapport with a client. And very important, it's more like a going through that process of knowing each other, like a, in a very formal um, help, like a, how can I help you? It's more like a, the person needs to be ready to disclose what they have. It's more like as giving them the information. This is what we, well, even like a, giving them the information, what is the meaning of to come to a new country? Uh, as sharing experiences, majority of us, I mean like a, we are, from different countries who experience uh, the, the immigration process, getting a language, getting uh, our children get the, the language faster than we do, asking them open-ended questions. It's more like a knowing each other, I am here to help you uh, with a lot of empathy. And in some cases, like, uh, Talk about the cultural aspect. How is for them to live in a new country? How is how it was for them to leave the, uh, our countries? It's more like an open communication. Questions be be present with them, and open to them. And it, it is very difficult sometimes for clients to disclose, especially this kind of issue, alcohol issues. They deny this some kind of like a maybe social aspect. Everybody drinks, everybody does the celebration with the, the beers or a glass of wine. For them, it's something like a, they don't realize that maybe they have the addiction problem. And not easy for them to talk. It's not easy, not only for migrant people, but for everybody. Not easy to talk. There is a denying part. So most probably it's more like a being open and open communication. 
is very important on this and, and empathetic to the person. Even we have um, some patients, they have a severe liver disease, but still they are not open to treatment. They feel that they are doing well, they are functioning very well, so they don't accept that they have this problem. So the important part is we need to be with them, we need to uh, educate them, we need to support them. So once you build that repo, so then patients, they start opening up. So we have so many clients like that, but in the beginning, they are always in denial mode, but when they listen us, when we talk to them, so it takes some time to, to, get it, to accept, accept that, that they are having this issue. So then, then we can leave them with a, with a further treatment. Okay, well, th I, thank you so much. And I would like to thank Tijinder Gill, Luz Marina, and Harinda Kamboy from Diversity Community Services Soci Resources Society um, for sharing and presenting your knowledge during today's webinar. So thank you so much. Um, on the next slide, um, we have something very exciting that we're, we're announcing today, and we will be s sending and sharing an email with everyone. Um, but AMSA's Migrant Worker Support um, Website Hub is live. So our URL is www.migrantworkerhub.ca. And on this website hub, you will find um, dedicated resources um, and tools to support everyone from service providers um, and empl employers who work with migrant workers. Um, and so on this website, you will be able to find um, some information sheets, online videos, the recording of our webinars. Um, we're also currently in the process of creating an e-learning um, resource. And so that will be also on um, this website as well. So. Um, so just wanted to inform everyone that the website is live. Um, and we also have a dedicated quarterly newsletter that we will be distributing. Um, if you would like to sign up to the mailing list to receive the newsletter and any other information um, regarding um, supporting migrant workers, please send an email to migrantworkerhub at amsa.org. That's migrantworkerhub at amsa.org. And we'll just add you to that mailing list. Um, so I just wanted to, in our closing remarks, um, say thank you to everyone for, for joining us today, for taking part in the polls, for sending your questions. Um, we will be emailing participants an online evaluation form. And please take the time to complete this as AMSA really relies on the feedback provided to plan future events and topics. I would like to say a special thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, for, for giving us their time and for sharing their experience and their knowledge with everyone supporting migrant workers. Um, and I just want to finally say thank you to um, the AMSA team, to, to Alejandra, to Khan, and to Julie um, for, for ensuring that today's webinar um, runs smoothly. Um, and also, we just I just posted um, Alejandra's email address on the closing slide, so please feel free to um, connect with Alejandra, who's our Migrant Worker Support Coordinator, um, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions. So she's always open there um, by email to, to be in contact and connect with you. And finally, I just want to thank, um, on the last slide, um, I would like to um, finally thank and acknowledge once again that today's webinar has been funded um, by the Government of Canada's Migrant Worker Support Network program, and thank you for, for funding um, today's event. So thank you to everyone. Um, great everyone was able to take part in today's webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>